This graph will change the way you train. At least, I hope so. Let's do this. So picture this. On the x-axis, we have intensity of exercise. The far left is very low intensity, like stretching. And the far right is very high intensity, like a full out 10k run. And the y-axis just shows an increase in any of the variables on the graph. As the intensity increases, your body will face two lactate thresholds called LT1 and LT2. Based on these, we can categorize intensities into three different zones, low, medium, and high. Then we can draw lines for the amount of fats and carbs your body uses for energy. At low intensities, most of the energy comes from fats, but as the intensity grows, your body burns less fats and more carbs for energy. Finally, as the intensity increases, your body produces more and more lactate. Now, if the lactate concentration gets too high, your body is unable to clear it out from your muscles and you get fatigued. You can also think of lactate as stress on your body. The more lactate, the more stress on your body. Now, many recreational athletes spend most of their time in zone two. The intensity is comfortably hard, so you feel like you're, you're actually doing some proper work without it being too uncomfortable. But even though it might feel as if this zone two is the best zone to train in, in most cases it's not. Training in zone 1 is the best zone for developing your oxidative system. In other words, increasing your body's ability to use fats as an energy source. And being able to burn fat efficiently is really important for uh, long, sustained endurance efforts. Because unlike carbs, we have a lot of fat stored in our body. Training in this zone also strengthens your slow twitch muscle fibers, which you need for long sustained efforts. On the far right, training with high intensity in zone 3 is a good zone for developing your glycolytic system. In other words, improving your body's ability to use carbs as an energy source. Also, there's a high amount of lactate produced at this intensity, so zone 3 can improve your body's ability to mitigate lactic acid. And then we have zone 2, the gray zone. Training in this zone burns a mix of carbs and fats, so it doesn't really make you super efficient in burning either one of those. Of course, zone 2 training does train the oxidative system, but there's more lactate produced, so it is more stressful to your body than training in zone 1, so you'd be better off training in zone 1 if you want to improve your oxidative system, because then you can recover faster from the training. And sure, training in zone 2 can improve your ability to clear lactate, but if that's what you're aiming for, why would you not want the maximum benefit and train in zone three where there's even more lactate produced. But having said this, there is nothing inherently wrong about training in zone two. In fact, it can produce some benefits if it's used wisely. For instance, training in zone two can help you develop your type 2A muscle fibers or your medium twitch muscle fibers, which can help your slow twitch muscle fibers carry some of the load during the longer effort efforts and make moderate race efforts more manageable. The problem comes when you do not realize that you're mostly training in zone zone 2, in the gray area. Because if you never run easy, you're not properly training your slow twitch muscle fibers and fat oxidation capabilities. And as training in zone 2 is quite stressful on the body, training regularly in zone 2 makes it hard for you to muster enough energy into your high intensity training, which really needs to be hard. A good distribution, which is used by most elite athletes, is to train 80% in zone 1, and then the remaining 20% in zone 2 and 3. Often it might be just 5% in zone 2 and 15% in in zone 3, and in polarized training, there's no training in zone 2, just easy and hard training in zones 1 and 3. But then, of course, the question is, how do you know where your LT1 and LT2 are? How do you know when you're training easy, moderate and hard intensities? An easy way to figure out your LT1 or your first threshold is to do what is called the talk test. Very simply, if you can speak in full sentences without taking a breath in, you're most likely training in zone one. And if you cannot speak in full sentences without taking a breath, a breath in, you're most likely training in zones two or three, like I am here. And if you want to be a bit more accurate, you can use your max heart rate to determine your LT1. LT1 is often at around 75% of your max heart rate. This of course does vary, but if you're training below 75% of your max heart rate, you can be quite confident that you're still in zone 1. 
And just to give you some scale or some perspective, 75% of my max heart rate is about 145 beats per minute. And I've often heard uh, people going on easy runs with a heart rate of 170 or above. And that is just, you know, way too much. Quick point, I'm actually talking about my max heart rate for running. Um, different sports actually have a different max heart rate, or they're not called max heart rates, they're called heart rate peaks. It's just that running is really stressful on your body and you're likely to get uh, the highest heart rate with the running. For instance, for cycling, your max heart rate or peak heart rate is usually around 5 to 10 beats per minute slower than it is for running. So. Just keep in mind that you need to figure out your max heart rate or peak heart rate for different sports separately. So you can't just do one test and then be done with it. All right, let's uh, just continue. There are many ways to estimate your max heart rate. One way is to do repeated short runs up a hill and then observe your highest heart rate. Damn. The things I do for, for beat roll. You can find more details of field tests like this from Polar's blog. I'll, I'll put the link below. And you might have heard that some people calculate their, their uh, max heart rate with the formula 220 minus your age. It can give you uh, like a ballpark estimate, but uh, you shouldn't really use it. Because there are some big individual differences. And if you are one of those outliers who have a really high or really low heart rate, you can get like really bad information with that formula. Now, estimating your LT2 usually requires you to suffer quite a lot. One way to do it is to do an hour of power. So for biking, this would mean cycling as hard as you can for an hour, and your LT2 would be your average power for that hour. For running, it would mean running as hard as you can for an hour, and then taking your average pace for that hour. And if that just sounds like a lot, like it does to me. Uh, a more practical way to do it is to do an FTP test. But again, I'll just have uh, these testing protocols in the links below. And if you want to get the most accurate estimation of your lactate thresholds, you can do some testing at a lab. Usually the way it's done in a lab is that you start slow and a lactate measurement is taken, then the speed is increased every five minutes and lactate is measured at each interval. So there's also plenty of suffering there, but that is the gold standard for uh, figuring out your lactate thresholds. But even though it's really good to know your LT2 if you want to progress your training to the next level, it's not the main message of this video. The main message of this video is to keep your easy runs easy. Because that's probably the most common problem that uh, many, uh, many endurance athletes do. So the next time you train, consider doing the talk test and make sure that you're able to speak in full sentences without breathing throughout the, the training session. And if anyone asks why are you talking to yourself, uh, just tell them that a YouTuber told you to do so. I know. Merch is launching soon for any of those, those of you who are interested. There's gonna be a link below. Stoked!